Surrender is not something we can do. All we can do is clean up our mess, purify our hearts, clean the mirror of our minds, and when surrender happens, it happens by grace. We can only prepare for it. But we can get a little cranky too, you know. We can say, hey, you got to do this. This is your problem. Take care of this. And they listen. They really do. Really, when I, you know, when I, I told you, you know this story very well. <clears throat> and if you don't, you'll soon know it better. But I told you, and in my book, I wrote it in a lot of detail. When I started to sing with people after a little while, I knew what, I could see what was going to happen, you know. I, I don't know why. I just, I understood that all this stuff would happen. And I also saw that there was no way that I would not use all this to feed my ego because I was hungry. I wanted stuff. And when you're hungry, you eat. That's what you do. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem was that I, I was feeling so disconnected from Maharaji that the reason I started singing was to reestablish that connection from my side. In other words, I felt I had lost that connection. So... Not that he'd gone anywhere, but I myself had lost the connection, or the feeling of the connection. I hadn't lost it. You can't lose it because it isn't there to lose. It's who we are. But that being said, in my mind and emotions, I was feeling very bad, and I felt like I had lost that love and that connection. So I knew that chanting would, would the only thing I could do to help myself. So once I started chanting and I saw what, what was going to happen, I saw that there's no way I'm not going to misuse all this whatever that's being given to me to feed my hungry desires. And it, it, ter it terrified me and, and horrified me. Because I, see, I saw not only was I going to hurt myself, but I was going to hurt other people. So I quit singing. I went back to India and I decided to stay for a, a long time. In those days, it was about three months I stayed. <clears throat> and I said to Maharaja, you have to fix this. This is your problem. I'm singing to people in your name. You don't fix this, I'm not singing. That's all there is to it. Good night. <laughs> and I'd wake up the next morning and nothing happened. Same shit as usual. It was terrible. And every day it got worse. I'd wake up and it was the same. And I was in terrible despair because I was being prevented from doing the only thing that could help me by my own stuff, by my own... I hate to say the word, but it's, it's a good word in some ways. Impurities. My own selfishness. My own greed. My own lust. My own desires to, for fame and, and, and all that stuff, you know? That's what, it was my stuff. And it was preventing me from doing the only thing that I could do to save my miserable ass. It was a terrible situation. I really can't tell you how terrible it was. It was, I was in such despair. It was just, and I'd say, you, what's wrong? I say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you do this? Come on, get it together. You know, I'm not singing. You're not doing it. I'm not singing. That's all there is to it. So, and I, I had, uh, well, okay, so I was still in India, and the next day was this, there was this big bandara at the temple in Kenshi, which is the celebration of the opening of the temple many years before. <coughs> And uh, it was going to be like m my last day or next to last day in India. And nothing had happened. Nothing had changed. And so I was feeling unable to go back and sing. Right? It was a terrible. So I went out. You know, in the old days when I was living with Maharaji, there was maybe one electric light in the whole valley. And now there's lights everywhere. The temple's all lit up at night. But there's one place in the back of the temple like that's still like in shadows. So you can sit there and still see the sky. 
So that's where I would go and I would talk to him, you know. And I said, what are you doing? What's going on here? You haven't changed anything. I said, I don't understand. Why don't you do this? Well, I, I, I don't know why you're not doing it, but I can't make you do it if you don't want to. All right, I'll go back. I'll sing, How Bad Could It Be? Good night. In retrospect, that was the moment of surrender. That moment changed everything. I no longer was demanding God to do something for me the way I wanted it done, when I wanted it done. And I was saying, all right, I'll deal with it. I don't like it, but I'll deal with it. And I was willing to come back and sing. And the next day, everything changed. He did something. He changed me. He changed something in my heart. And I was free to come back and really sing. So, it was that accepting of myself the way I was, really, and saying, okay, I'll go on. And that opened everything up. You can't fake that. Wouldn't it be nice if we could? <laughs> Everything would be so cool. Oh, I'm okay, I'll deal with it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> you can't fake it. But when it happens, it changes everything. Even a little thing like that made such a big difference. It opened the door. And he came in. So. <coughs> so don't be waiting for a guru. This is pure insanity, which is no big deal because everything we do is completely insane. You have your life. Your life is your guru. And everything in your life is there because it's supposed to be there for whatever reason. The reasons we don't know why. Listen, in the creation hymn of the Rig Veda, the number one hymn, the big time hymn. It says, in the beginning, this happened, and then that happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this, and this and it goes on. And at the end it says, and, only, and why? What is the reason for all this, the cause? Only he in highest heaven knows. Or perhaps he knows not. <laughs> if that son of a bitch doesn't know, what are we going to do? It really says that. God damn it. So I think we just ought to chill, huh? What's the big deal? But when there is a big deal, deal with it. That's why it's called a big deal. <clears throat> It's nice to do this before I wake up. <laughs> All right, any questions or anything? Anything anybody have anything to say? Where's the mic anyway? Right there. Right there. You have somebody over here? No? Over there. <coughs> How do you maintain your own equilibrium when times are tough? By waiting for the microphone. <laughs> Hi. I'd like to uh, just ask you, what are the rest of the members of the group? Hold on. We, uh, Kevin just hit his head instead oh. of my head for a change. 
I might be able to hear you. Go ahead. Let me, let me see. Go ahead. I was, I was wondering uh, what the rest of the band members are going to do in 2016. What am, what am I going to do in nope. 2016? Well, what are the rest of the band members going to do? Uh, the rest of the group? Uh, well, um, most of them are going to play with Springsteen, I think. <laughs> do I know? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what they're going to do. We'll see. We'll figure it out. I, I imagine Genevieve will s still take care of her baby. That would be a nice thing. <laughs> Itachi! Hapuki! And uh, Nina will still take care of me. Arjun will keep banging on things. And will Mark will, you know, whatever he's doing now, he'll keep doing. I'm trying to figure out what that is. And Robert will be waiting for the next year when I get here. I don't know. We'll see. I just need to rest. By the way, you should see the stuff that's on Facebook and the emails I'm getting. What's wrong with you? I'm a healer. I, if I hear the word heal one more time... I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> then let's see what they can heal me. <laughs> Jesus, it's unbelievable. But I appreciate everybody's concern. But there's nothing wrong with me. I just want to take some rest. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. We're good? Really, uh, you know, as far as I know, and I just had a full exam, you know, what, what year is this? <laughs> See, I think in high school I had a full exam. And they said, it's okay, if I took testosterone injections, everything will be all right. Um, I just had an exam, full examination last fall. Everything's fine. They didn't find anything. In between my ears, there's absolutely nothing whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, that's the story, okay? Hello out there, that's okay, please? Okay. Yeah, okay. No, those are the streamers. So I just need to, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I only had six months off I took. Um, I was forced to, but it turned out to be the greatest six months of my life. Slept, watched TV, hung out. It was fantastic. Um, you know, and 20 years, I've really been traveling almost full time. So, <clears throat> just a few months to chill and recuperate. Had plastic surgery and a few major operations. <laughs> See how young I look? People were saying, wow, a little rest, look what it did for him. <laughs> so anybody else? Who is somebody over there? You with the stick. <laughs> Take the microphone so everybody can hear, even though you yell. <clears throat> Thank you. How, in times that are tough in your life, do you maintain your own equilibrium? How, what was the beginning? How what? When times are tough in your own life, how do you maintain your own <clears throat> equilibrium? I don't. <laughs> I, 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 you know, what, what, when, you know, I don't. I just keep doing what I do, which is chanting and whatever practices I do, whether it's good or bad or out there. It, I'm not concerned with holding on to any equilibrium. I don't think about it. I don't even think about my own happiness necessarily much. It's not my main concern. I don't know what my main concern is, <laughs> but it's probably not me much of the time. So it's not an issue, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not 
I don't go through my days trying to hold on to any particular feeling or any particular state. I'm not always evaluating anymore. Luckily, because if I was evaluating, I wouldn't be very happy. See? You don't evaluate, you're happy. That's the way it works. Really. Once those starts, you stop grabbing onto all those thoughts about how is it now, how am I doing, oh, why will it always be like this, I'll never get it together, and why should I do this, I can't meditate, I can't sit, I can't do asanas, I can't do anything. Once you, once you just stop taking that shit seriously, you feel a lot better. And that's the way it should be. Why do we take that stuff so seriously? Who are we to judge ourselves? Who gave us that right? You know, who, who said you are the judge? Nobody. Our own minds. And maybe our mothers. <laughs> and our fathers put all that into us, you know. It's a program that's running. There's no reason to believe it. Except that we do. So what do we do? We do practices and that helps us release those programs that are running. All the self-hatred and the self-evaluation and the self-judgment and the self-this and the self-that and the self-this. It's a waste of time. It's a real waste of time. And you begin to see how much time we spend just thinking about ourselves all day long. Every day. It's all about me. What am I doing? Where am I going? Do they like me? They don't like me. What should I wear? Where should I go? Should I do this? Should I do that? It's boring. It's so boring. We think somehow it's necessary. Why do we think that? You think the whole world is going to crumble if we don't think about ourselves. I don't think so. But we can't stop. You can't just stop. You can't stop a thought. Where is it? You're going to grab it and kill it. You can't. So you do some practice. You pay some attention. You notice that you're gone all the time. And by the time you're noticing, you're already back. But then you're gone again. And then you notice again. Oh. And you, you, you do some japa, some, some chanting, some practices that slow you down, make things a little bit more obvious and more clear. But there's absolutely no reason to be sitting around taking notes about yourself all day long. That's just more ego bullshit. Really. Waste of time. But that's what we do. That's what everybody does. So we do it. <clears throat> you know, and who is it that said this? Uh, I forget who it was. When some saint said that... Um, you know, we take, we take things very seriously and we take things very personally. We take our moods very personally and, and we think that there's something wrong with us. But really, it's not just, it's the whole world, you know. You might notice there is a world out there. And it's, it's the atmosphere of the whole world that we're living in that makes life very difficult for for us personally, on a daily basis, it's not only our personal issues, but it's the issues of the whole universe, of the whole world, in which we're living in very difficult times for everybody. So if you're upset or depressed, it's not necessarily because of something wrong with you, but everybody, we're kind of sharing a, a database on the planet, and most of it is pretty dark. So, so on the other hand, the fact that we're interested in this stuff at all is just amazing. Really. Really amazing. There's no logical reason to be sitting here when we could be eating steak and drinking beer. Well, now we'd probably have to clean up the grill. It's Monday. So, this, you know, give, we should give ourselves some credit because this is... Uh, this is the result of our own karmas that we're interested in this stuff at all. And the grace that's already in our lives. And the longing that, that's already in our hearts. That's a very good thing, a very positive thing, a very pure thing. When we went to India, you know, all we wanted to do was stare at Maharaji. We didn't care about anything. We just. 
That's all I wanted to do. And he would just laugh, you know. <laughs> he would say to the other Indians, you miserable people come here and you don't bring me anything. You don't want, all, all you want is things. Look at these people. They don't want anything. They just want God. And we would say, what is he talking about? But thinking about it, we didn't want to eat. We didn't want anything. We just wanted to stare at him. And we, because all the beauty of the universe was wrapped up in the blanket, you know. All the, we were seeing God with our own eyes. And you didn't want anything else. It was true what he said. And we had left the world, the land of everything, to sit in the dirt, you know, in 120 degrees, you know. We didn't even notice it. And that was the result of our own karmas. And, and it's a great blessing, you know, for all of us that we have that desire to live in that kind of love. That's why we're here. There's a great saint, poet named Namdev, Maharati, Maharati poet. <coughs> And he, he wrote a poem. I, I don't remember the whole poem, but it goes something like this. He said, you know, I've been with the yogis. I got all that. I've been with the, the saints and the sages and the Vedas. Yeah, got that. I studied all the philosophies. No problema. He said, but I've been saved from all this by the grace of the saints. The secret is the love. That's what he said. He's saying, I, all the stuff that other people think, you know, this, this philosophy, yoga, powers, all this stuff, no problem, I got all that. I've been saved from all that by the grace of the saints. The secret is the love. The secret is the love. That's what nobody gets. Nobody understands except those who do. It's, it's only a secret because it is. I mean, it's out in pure sight, but it's in plain sight, but it's people don't see. People get busy with other stuff. And he's saying even all that stuff, that which some people hold in great uh, value, you know, the Vedas and yoga and powers and philosophies, it, even that I've been saved from, that the secret is the love. And Ramana Maharshi, who was, without a doubt, one of the greatest saints of ever, and certainly of this generation, used to sleep with that book by his pillow, Namdev's poetry. The secret is the love. No, no, what? Who made you God? I have to make you God, and I didn't do that. There's something very personal to you, and uh, if you're not very comfortable, you could uh, decline to answer. Mm -hmm. Is that when you're uh, doing these kirtans and singing for all of us, uh, what, what is the state which you are in, and what, what, is, what, what, have, you, what have you experienced uh, at the Highest state which you've reached? Huh. I don't know. <laughs> it's not relevant. I'm just like you. I'm doing my practice. If I'm thinking something, I let it go. And I come back to the name. You keep letting go, you keep letting go, you keep letting go until you can't let go. And then you got it. Then you've become it. Whatever I'm experiencing, I don't even pay attention to it. I might notice it, but then... I let it goes. If I was thinking about what am I experiencing, that's just more ego, more self-delusion, more self-involvement. Uh, it's not an issue. I don't care what I'm experiencing. I want the name. I want, I want to keep remembering the name because remembering the name gives me the strength to let go of anything that isn't the name. And the name and what, and what is named are not different. That's what they say. 
but we don't know that. The name and what is named, meaning God and her and his name, are not different. But we don't know that. When we do know, then we'll know. So in the meantime, anything that comes up between me and the name, I, I just it just goes away. My whole effort is to remember the name. And when I am remembering the name, I'm not sitting there thinking, wow, I'm really remembering the name. <laughs> that, why should, that's just more nonsense, right? It's wanting to be immersed in that fully. So anything that comes up, it just goes. And because I do this all the time, so much with such intensity, you know, that it, it, that letting go muscle has gotten, you know, fairly active. And the more you do it, the more it works. And, uh, you know, uh, Ramakrishna told a story about w what the name is and how it works. He said, uh, is he up there? Yeah, there he is. One, two, three, four, five, from the end. <clears throat> He's in Bhav Samadhi. So he said, every repetition of the name is a seed. Okay? Every repetition of the name is a seed that we're planting. Every repetition of the name is a seed that gets planted. And the seeds kind of, you might say, they get caught in the wind, right? And they get blown around and they land on the roof of an old house in the middle of the jungle somewhere. And in those days, the roofs sometimes were made from clay tiles that were dried in the sun. They weren't really dried in a furnace, right? But they were dried in the sun and over the, the seeds of the name got caught, get caught between the tiles of the roof of this old house. And when it rains and then wind and heat and everything, over years the tiles start to break down back into mud. And then the seeds take root. Right? And they start to grow. And they keep growing. And they keep growing. And they destroy the roof of the house. And they keep growing, and they destroy the whole house. Ramakrishna said, that house is who you think you are. Who you think you are. And when you don't think you are who you think you are, there's only open, wide space in all directions. You are present everywhere. You're not gone. You're present everywhere. There's no me and them, inside and out in the house and outside of the house. The house is a temporary structure that was built for certain reasons, by certain causes and conditions. The ego is a temporary structure created out of certain causes and conditions. When those causes and conditions are removed, this temporary structure is no longer apparent. It's just not here. But we're here. It's not empty of things. It's not dead. It's full. It's empty of anything permanent because everything passes and changes. But it's full of clarity. It's full of love. It's full of light and truth. But there's no delusion of a of a separate self anymore. It's just a delusion, a temporary delusion. But it's a good delusion. It works pretty well. So that's how it works. And you notice he doesn't say what you feel like as this house is falling apart. It's not relevant, the question you asked. It's just not relevant. Who cares? Well, who might care, but you just come back to the name, and then who disappears? 
<coughs> One time I was really cranky in Australia. It was in Melbourne, Australia. I was really, it was hot. We, there was five or six hundred people in the room and we had no time for a sound check and it was hot and muggy and there was no air conditioning and we, we came on stage and we had to start singing and I, we were tired and oh, I was really cranky and I'm singing. Ah, and I'm talking to Maharaji and I, you know, and I said to him in my mind, I said, what would it be like if I could really sing to you? And immediately, this wind came, this cool breeze came over me. And I went into this like ecstasy. And I was going like, Shri Ram, Shri Ram. And I started, and Ty was playing drums with me and he was looking at me like. <laughs> and I said, just follow me. You know? And he's like, you know, I was all over the place. I completely lost it, right? And I said, okay, enough. Let me get back to this. <laughs> so I think he keeps me, you know, grounded to do this work. And that cleans my heart. He used to say, I know this is going to scare you or confuse you. But he used to say things like, I have the keys to the mind. He used to look at it and say, I could turn your minds against me. Ha! We said, don't do that! <laughs> and he'd laugh, ah! You just, can you imagine waking up in India you know, one day and you go, ah, what am I doing here? I'm going to go home and watch TV. This is crazy. I'm gonna... <laughs> Which is exactly what happened. We call it transfer hogya. He transferred us. When your time came, boom, you were gone. And it, it, it just happened. Like people, like I said, you know, people would like, it was a lot of juice. It was a lot of love. It was, a, it was, you know, and there's a lot of horny people there. Us Westerners. And we're not used to like, you know, living, you know, like. So stuff would happen, right? And he would go, oh, hey, you're friends. Oh, this is good. They're friends. Huh? And the next day he said, oh, you're very good friends. Huh? Yeah, that's good. They're good friends. Next day, boom, you're married, go back to America. No, 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 no. I was so uptight, it was ridiculous. I was so tightly wound, I was I didn't want to come back to America ever. So I really, one time uh, this woman came up to me in the morning and she said, do you think if two people are together, Maharaji would put them together? I said, sure. She said, Oh, so why don't you ask Maharaji to marry us? What? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so later in the day, we're all sitting in front of Maharaji, and he, I'm sitting here, and he points, like, next to me, and there was this guy sitting there. I said, him? Because sometimes he asked me to translate a little bit. I said, him? Nee, nee. And I turned, and there was another guy here. Nay, nay. And it was this woman. Right? And he says, do you love her? And I said, oh, Maharaji, I love her so much as a sister. <laughs> he laughed. He said, oh, Krishna Das is really cunning. <laughs> but chalak. That was the least of it. Chalak was almost like saying you're God in human form. Next to the other stuff he said. <clears throat> he just laughed. It's really so simple, but we do make it very difficult because we're very complex beings. We're very emotional, we're very mental, we're very physical. 
And the simplicity of the love, is, it, it, it's very hard to perceive it in our confusion and delusion. But that's okay. It's okay to be stupid. That's what I, exp I you know, I, I, that's, but that was part of that experience that he gave me, which changed my life. That, you know, so I saw that it was okay when, that I, that I, that I didn't know all the time. That I was, I say stupid, just in a joking way. That I was, that I forgot, that I forget. It didn't matter. It doesn't affect this. It doesn't affect reality. This is what it is. Love is always here. The presence of God is always here. The grace is always here. Whether we remember it or not, it's here. And our work is to try to remind ourselves to remember. That's all. It's very simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. Okay, so I'm not certain that I actually am, if I remember this story or if I'm making it up, but did Maharaji have a notebook? Had, have any what? A notebook. He used to write Ram Ram every day in a little notebook. Could yeah. you tell that story again and talk about it a little bit? I don't know what story there is about it. Um, Just that every day he wrote Ram Ram either... A few times or a few, you know, not not like all day, but just like every day. Yeah. Oh, and then the story about him leaving the body was that <clears throat> the day before he left Kenchi and two days before he left the body, he wrote for that day, he wrote for the next day, and he wrote for the next day. And then he gave the book to Sidney Ma and said, from now on, you write. And by the time she had a day to write, that was the day he had, he had left the body that day. And he knew he was going. Uh, when he was leaving Kenshi, the this man who was very close to him came to drive him down to the train to, to go to uh, Agra. And uh, supposedly Maharaja had a heart problem. That's what, you know. So he was going to see the heart doctor. So the guy comes to drive him. He said, okay, Baba, just let me check your pulse first. So Maharaj puts his hand out. And the guy says, that's it. I'm not taking you anywhere until there's a pulse. <laughs> <laughs> so Maharaj goes like this. Okay, now. Okay, jello, let's go. You know. So then he goes to the, the heart doctor, and the heart doctor says, Baba, there's nothing wrong. You just need some rest. But then that was the day he left the body. <laughs> I once heard a song. You may have left your body, but you haven't left me. If I had only believed it when I wrote it, it would have been better. Anybody? Back there, just behind you. <clears throat> so I just found um, Ram Dass's podcasts, and uh, it's been fabulous listening to him, and uh, Raghu, uh, who introduces the podcast, mm -hmm. had talked about marriage and um, how... I never, one thing I never do is I never discuss my relationships with Ram Das. <laughs> he gives the worst advice, <laughs> guaranteed to destroy any possibility of anything. <laughs> <laughs> I never ask him about relationships, and I've known him since 1968. Next, 
What were you saying? <laughs> so um, he, he does give a lot of advice about. Well, this is actually Raghu and his portion of it, and and not that he gave advice at all, but it was really confusing for me how he said that Maharaji married he and the, the woman, and then he, then they get divorced, mm -hmm. and I, you know. There's only and, one couple together from those, that time that came together at Maharaji's feet. There's only one couple still married. So I don't understand that. I don't understand. And then when, as you talk about it, it sounds like he only married them just to get them out of his presence. So now I'm really confused about marriage. <laughs> um, he didn't marry them. They started getting it on. And then he said, okay, you're married. Go back to America. Yeah, he didn't need you there. He didn't, he didn't need you there. You wanted to be there, but he, he didn't need you there. So it was a nice opportunity to get rid of people. And, you know, Indians have a different view of relationships than we do. Westerners are very... Um, we imagine there might be some happiness in relationships. So right there, we're screwed. <laughs> Indians don't imagine that the same way. They, in the previously generations, have been arranged marriages. And the couple learns to live together. They learn to be friends. And real love really, many times, really develops between these two people. Real caring and compassion for another human being, not based on romantic uh, romantic love, which, as you know, comes and goes and disappears when one day it was there and the next day it's not. So our relationships are based much, mostly on ro romantic love. And that changes with the wind, you know? And that's who we are and that's who the, those people were in those days with Maharaji. Yes, he married them, but, but their own stuff pulled them apart. And I don't think it's, it was bad that they did that, that they got divorced. I think they're all much happier now than they were in those relationships. Because, also because being with Maharaji, you were, you were in this very open, loving space. And you weren't seeing your shadows, which are there. But you weren't seeing them, almost because the sun was high noon, so to speak. And then you come back to America and the sun starts to set <laughs> and the shadows get big. And then you, how do you deal with it? Well, you could say that we couldn't hold on to that love and that you wouldn't be wrong. We couldn't hold on to that space because we had lots of karma and lots of attachment and lots of darkness in our psyches, in our emotional bodies. He showed us he brought us into the room where love lives. We ourselves took ourselves out of that room. And then all kinds of shit happened, you know. But I don't think it's bad in any way. And I don't think we failed, Maharaji. Those couples that aren't together, I don't think they failed in any way. In some ways, it takes a lot of courage to go through finding yourself, you know, in this world now who you are. It was one thing to be with him because everything was all right and was always going to be all right. That's a state of mind which can't be maintained by most of us most of the time. For Indians, uh, he was very different. You know, he treated the Indians when he talked about marriage. There were very specific, you know, cultural rules that were followed and he was right in with that. But when it came to the Westerners, he dealt with reality, <laughs> which we weren't prepared for, but we were learning. Yeah. OK?
Um, so I asked you a question yesterday, kind of, and you touched on it, I think, in the beginning of this whole yeah. session. Mm -hmm. um, but the love <laughs> that you're talking about, like, between you and Maharaji or whatever love we're looking for, how am I, how, how is my generation supposed to find that when we don't have, like, Martin Luther King or we don't have, like, mm -hmm. like a Gandhi or, like, a Mother Teresa and we don't have that love? Mm -hmm that you're talking about, because you're not talking about like romantic love. So then where, mm -hmm. besides family, where do I find that? Yeah, I don't know how my generation's gonna find that. <laughs> talking about my, my g -g generation. She doesn't even know who the who is. <laughs> Um, it's a really good question, but you know we have. I think we've been talking. It's been that's been a big theme of today. You know, um, sorry. More specifically, could you just like answer it? Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just like feel like we're getting around to it, but yeah, I just, I'm waiting for the download. Would you? It's, it's a slow connection. Now just shut up. It's not broadband out here in Yogaville. It's a very thin band. You, you were born where you were born, when you were born, and as who you were born, all for particular reasons to fulfill the karmas that you have to fulfill. And you will do that. There's no doubt that you will do that. How that's going to happen is like, you know, nobody knows. But there's nothing, you know, you shouldn't feel that you've missed anything. Uh, that's just the mind trip. And you're, uh, it's not reality. Was I, what was the difference between, the only difference between the day before I met Maharaji, which actually was when I met Ramdas, by the way, not when I met Maharaji physically, by the time I met Maharaji physically, I already knew he was my guru. I already had dreams of him. In fact, I'll tell you, you know, so I had met Ram Das, and um, the minute I walked into the room with Ram Das, without a word being spoken, I knew that it was real. Whatever it is. I didn't know what it is. I didn't know what to call it. But something in me just knew that it was real, that it existed in the world, it could be found, and it was, you know, and that changed everything. Everything in my life, and nothing happened, not even a word was spoken. And then I saw this little black and white picture on the wall, you know, of this, he said this is his guru. And I said, that's nice, you know. So then, sometime after that, I had this dream, right? I walked into my elementary school gymnasium and you know where we used to play dodgeball and have dances on rainy days you know and at the end of the gymnasium there was a little stage where they had we had musicals and stuff like that and I walked into this gymnasium and there on the stage was Maharaji and he was sitting on a wood bench wood bed and there was a man standing next to him just behind him with a white shirt and a dhoti and a black vest. And I walked into the gymnasium, and in the middle of the gym, I just did what they call dunda pranam. I just fell down flat on my face and put my arms out like this, and I'm, I was praying with every molecule, please let me feel something. I have to feel something. I was consumed with this. I have to feel something. Let me feel something, right? And as I'm lying there, I saw Maharaji get up. He came down the steps at the end of the stage, and he walked over to me, and he puts his hand back here on the back of my head. And I started to calm down, and I started to calm down, and then I, this bliss started to run through my body. 
like nothing I had ever felt before. And I had taken every drug known to man. <laughs> so, nothing I had ever felt before. And it got stronger and stronger and stronger. And I said, I'm going to die. And just at that instant, he took his hand off my head. He went back and sat down. And I woke up. And I was still filled with this incredible feeling, right? So this was uh, shortly after I met Ramdas. Then about a year and a half later, I went to India. And I'd been in India about a year. And one day I came to the temple late. Uh, I, I don't know, I was doing something in Nanital. And as I walked into the courtyard, Maharaji was walking across the courtyard by himself. And at that moment, I realized that I had never seen him walk. We'd only always been invited into a room where he was already sitting, or he would just come out and sit right down on the, the tucket, the cot that he sat on. And we never, I had never seen him walk. And I stopped because he was walking just the way he walked in my dream. He had a very unusual walk, like a, like a, like a three-year-old, like bong, 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 from one foot to the other. It's like, and people would hold his hand because it looked like he was going to fall over at any moment. <laughs> Bong, bong, you know? And I just stopped. And I had these apples, and I was holding the apples, right? And he stopped in the middle of the court, and he looked over at me, and he goes, and he laughed, and he goes, yeah, come here. And I, I didn't even know, I just floated over to him, and I'm standing in front of him like this. <laughs> and he just went, oh, these Westerners, and he grabbed the apples, and he threw them, and but he was walking the same way he walked in my dream. So, even before I met him, he was with me. It's not a requirement. I got lucky in this sense, but basically, and I tell this to everybody, nobody believes me. We went, he brought us there because we were the ones who wouldn't make it without that. And I could tell you, in my case, it's absolutely the truth. I would have been dead a long time ago. So loosen up a little bit, you know, lighten up a little bit. Don't be so clenched about all this. It's not like you think it is, OK? When you catch yourself like locked into that kind of fear and worry, just say, fuck off, get out of here and go back to your Ram Ram, which I know you're doing all the time. <laughs> Why? I could be. The Ram Ram you're doing all the time, every day, right? You. The Japa you're doing all the time. You just come back to that when you worry too much. You just let it go and come back to your prayers, to your breath. You have to practice letting go of that stuff. It's not real. You think it's real, and so you live like it's real. But there's other reasons you have those fears that aren't really tied to that, that the content of that fear. It's the fear itself, the anguish and the anxiety about life. And you, you attach it to that thing. But... Um, What did I have to go through after he died? Is that what you want? Oh, I wouldn't, w well, maybe I would. <laughs> Wish it on my worst enemy. You know, I mean, it, it's just, it was unbearable, right? But the heart wants what it wants, and it's not going to be, it's not going to let itself be told anything else, so you just have to live with it, and you'll see. You'll experience as time goes on. Everything's okay, and will be okay. But we have to learn how to let it be okay. That's our work. Okay. 
Somebody else? If not, I'm going to read a story, okay? Somebody else? You can wait. We can do it later. Back there, okay? <coughs> Could you please talk a little bit about the power of sacred sounds? No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Next. I mean, if I knew something about it, I'd be happy to talk about it. I don't know anything about it. But that's, that's something. I just sing. I just, I just sing to Maharaji. That's what I do. I don't know fuck all about anything. Thank you for uncomplicating that for me. I appreciate that so much. Anytime. I mean, do I have time to think about sacred sound? I want to sing to Maharaji. I want to be with him. Why would I think about that stuff? You know, I mean, but some people do. God bless them, as my grandfather used to say. He didn't mean it. find this one story. This is written by a, a man, Dr. America, Maharaji called him, Dr. Larry Brilliant, who's uh, just a great guy. And, uh, he later, Maharaji sent, later sent him to work for the smallpox eradication program, which at that time was completely stalled and not happening. And the whole thing got going, and they actually eradicated smallpox. Um, I don't know. We don't really know. We live in such a privileged atmosphere. We don't remember what it's like to have these diseases that would just come and kill hundreds of thousands of people. We haven't had that for a while here. It's not that long. You know, polio and stuff like that. Most people don't have polio now. It's been limited so much in the world. But smallpox would kill, constantly killing people in India and in the, in the third world countries everywhere, Africa too. And so Maharaji sent Dr. Larry to work at the smallpox program and, and they wound up eradicating smallpox in India. And at the same time, they managed to do that in Africa and right now there is no smallpox in the world, only in laboratories where they saved some of the virus just in case there's some outbreak they can make a vaccine. But there's no smallpox in the world. So this is Dr. Larry. He said, my wife had met Maharaji and had come to get me in America and bring me back to meet him. When we first went to meet Maharaji, I was put off by what I saw. All these crazy Westerners wearing white clothes and hanging around this fat old man in a blanket. <laughs> More than anything else, I hated seeing Westerners touch his feet. On my first day there, he totally ignored me. But after the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh day, during which he also ignored me, I began to get very upset. I felt no love for him. In fact, I felt nothing. I decided that if my wife had been captured by some crazy cult, I decided that my wife had been captured by some crazy cult. And by the end of the week, I was ready to leave. We were staying at the hotel up in Nanital. And on the eighth day, I told my wife that I wasn't feeling well. I spent the next day walking around the lake, thinking that if my wife was so involved in something that was so clearly not for me, it must mean that our marriage was at an end. I looked at the flowers, the mountains, and the reflections in the lake, but nothing could dispel my depression. And then I did something that I really had never done in my life, in my adult life. I prayed. I asked God, what am I doing here? 
Who is this man? These people are all crazy. I don't belong here. Just then I remembered the phrase, had ye but faith, ye would not need miracles. Okay, God, I don't have any faith. Send me a miracle. <clears throat> I kept looking for a rainbow, but nothing happened. So I decided to leave the next day. The next morning, we took a taxi down to Kenshi to the temple to say goodbye. Although I didn't like Maharaji, I thought I'd just be very honest and have it out with him. <laughs> we got to Kenshi before anyone else was there, and we sat in front of his tucket on the porch. Maharaji had not yet come out from inside of the room. There was some fruit on the tucket, and one of the apples had fallen on the ground. So I bent over to pick it up. Just at that moment, Maharaji came out of his room, and he stepped on my hand, <laughs> pinning me to the ground. So there I was, on my knees, touching his foot in the position I detested. How ludicrous. He looked down at me and asked, where were you yesterday? Then he asked, were you at the lake? And he said lake in English. When he said the word lake to me, I began to get this strange feeling at the base of my spine, and my whole body tingled. It felt really strange. He asked me, what were you doing at the lake? I began to feel very tight. Then he asked, were you horseback riding? <laughs> no. Were you boating? <laughs> no. Did you go swimming? No. <laughs> then he leaned over and spoke quietly. Were you talking to God? Did you ask for something? When he did that, I fell apart and started to cry like a baby. He pulled me over and started pulling my beard and repeating, did you ask for something? Did you ask for something? <laughs> that felt like my initiation. By then, others had arrived, and they were around me, caressing me, and I realized that almost everyone there had gone through some experience like that. <laughs> A trivial question such as, were you at the lake yesterday, which had no meaning to anyone else, shattered my perception of reality. It was clear to me that Maharaji saw right through all the illusions. He knew everything. By the way, the next thing he said to me was, will you write a book? <laughs> that was my welcome. After that, I just wanted to rub his feet. You know, we really can't imagine that our hearts will ever be let out of the cage they're in, you know. We can't believe that it could happen, but it will, and it does. And it's not religion, and it's not anything fancy, it's just life, you know. It's the longing we already have in our hearts, which is the response. So, like Mayor Baba said, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> right.
And as far as meeting a guru in a body, this is happening to people these days too. Maharaji comes to people right now in dreams, in life. Things happen to people. I get emails all the time. I have a friend who died recently. Um, cancer, but about 10 years before she died, she had a kidney, uh, an emergency she went into a coma and she had a kid, kid, emergency kidney surgery and she went to the hospital and she put this little she was in a coma for three days and she had a little picture of Maharaji on uh, her bed uh, on, on the table next to the bed all the time and then she went to this coma after the operation and when she came out of the coma the nurse said oh it's so glad I'm so happy that you you know you're come back and, and your grandfather came every day and he sat with you every day while you were in your coma. He said, my grandfather? He said, isn't that a picture of your grandfather? Oh. <laughs> so. It's only our own stuff that it keeps the door closed. It keeps us locked up. Right? That's all it is. It's just our stuff. So, let's, you can do something about it. That's the good news. The bad news is, nobody else can do it for you. <laughs> so, whatever it is you feel you can do, do. Back in the old days when I was living in the temple with my guru, we used to sing to him, but we used to just like stand there, go like, Ram, Ram. we didn't have instruments, we didn't have anything, we just kind of like. <laughs> so one day we were in, uh, in Brindavan, he has a temple there, Hanuman Temple, and one of the guys who was hanging out with us had a friend who was uh, in ISKCON, and had just brought all his disciples to Brindavan for the first time. So he invited him to come to Maharaja's temple and sing. So about 15 or 20 of the devotees came and they brought their drums and their bangers and their clangers and everything, you know. And so they sang for a long time and uh, Maharaja loved it and then they left. I was standing next to Maharaji. He reached into his dhoti and he pulled out 50 rupees. He handed it to me and said, go buy a drum. <laughs> so if you're wondering how all this started, <laughs> 50 rupees only, very good. I'll do the Krishnas and do the Rams. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare.
Krishna Hare Hare
How sweet the sound that saved a soul, a soul like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, so blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a soul, a soul like me. I once was lost, but Hare Amen. Uh-huh. 
Herr. 